to the webinar, Hope of Christ in the Old Testament. I understand I hear from um, uh, my colleagues at STM or rather uh, the organizers at STM that this evening we have the presence of brothers and sisters from all over the world, each of the five continents. So maybe we can spend uh, just some time, uh, a minute or so, to just send greetings to one another in the chat box, uh, as well as to send greetings to Bishop as well, whom we can see here uh, on the panel. Uh, let's just spend some time and uh, while you're doing that, just tell us where you're dialing in from as well. Wonderful. We have people from uh, all around Malaysia, uh, JB, Malacca, Selangor from Singapore, uh, also uh, KL as well. Uh, yes, from Klang, Penang, Tawau, Sabah, welcome. Cambodia, welcome. Myanmar as well uh, from Melbourne. Klang, Sarawak, wonderful. So good to have uh, all of us here gathered together to learn together from Guatemala. Welcome. Penang, uh, Instapa as well. Yes, from KL Ipoh. Wonderful. It's so good uh, to be gathered here with all of you uh, this morning uh, to just uh, hear and just uh, consider together uh, about this topic of hope of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, I will start. Uh, my name is Debbie. Uh, I'm a student with the STM KL Center to, uh, in the part-time program. And uh, often Christians are well versed with how passages in the Gospels and the rest of New Testament refers to texts and ideas in the Old Testament. And we see this especially on the road to Emmaus, where beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to his disciples in all the scriptures the things according, concerning himself uh, from uh, Luke. And since then, there has been many discussions, debates, about how much of the Old Testament is relevant for Christians today. And although we know in principle that Christ fulfills the law and the prophets, practically uh, it is a bit tricky, you know, when we deal with the text. And that is why I believe we are all here today to hear um, how to work this out. For those who are newer to working this out, uh, there are those who see the Christ typology everywhere in the Old Testament. And to others, um, they feel that they cannot really uh, see what is not explicitly there and feel this sometimes exercise may be pushing things too far. So certainly all of us here this evening have many questions and need much guidance in this area, especially those involved in teaching, preaching, writing, discipling, pastoring, and so on. And therefore we have with us today eminent Old Testament teacher, preacher, author, the Right Reverend Bishop Paul Barker to give us a few pointers in this area. This is our very simple, straightforward pro program. We will have a lecture by Bishop, followed by a Q&A uh, before we end at 9 o'clock. Uh, Bishop's uh, timing, I think, is two hours ahead, so we also want to give him an early night. So uh, just an introduction, the Right Reverend Dr. Paul Barker serves as Bishop in the Anglican Diocese of Melbourne and is no stranger to us all. He served as visiting scholar to STM, teaching the Old Testament between 2009 and 2016 before returning to Australia. He is much loved by students who continue to correspond with him. So um, do uh, feel free to um, give your warm welcome, your greeting to him in the chat box to say hello. Uh, and before we begin the lecture, uh, I would now like to call upon Pastor Alvin Tan uh, to open us in a word of prayer before passing the time to Bishop. Uh, Pastor Elvin, over to you. Thanks, Debbie. A very good evening to all. And once again, we welcome Bishop Paul to be with us this evening to share us with the word. Now to start off, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this blessed day. And we are grateful that you have brought us together through this online lecture. We pray that as you speak to us through your servant, Bishop Paul, you will grant that we may hear, learn, and understand that through the comfort of your holy word, we can embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. 
Over to you, Bishop Paul. Thanks, Alvin. It's good to see that Alvin's in Melbourne um, uh, from the picture behind him. Well, welcome, uh, everyone. It's very strange, in a way, giving a lecture to people I can't see. Um, and uh, But it's great to see names of uh, many former students and friends, uh, mainly in Malaysia, but a few from elsewhere as well. And uh, I wish that I was there, uh, to be honest. It's quite cold here, very wet, very windy, 12 degrees. And uh, But here we are. We're in lockdown in Melbourne, so I can't really even go more than 10 kilometers from my home. Well, it's a, a joy and a privilege to uh, give this lecture. I think uh, it's an important topic, actually. I think uh, often misunderstood. And um, uh, I'm sorry we don't have time for a, sort of the full interaction that uh, we'd normally have. But uh, I want to, uh, and I haven't got slides um, for this, but uh, Feel free to put in your questions, as uh, Debbie said, and we'll try and address as many questions as we can uh, at the end. Uh, as some of you will know, I used to be uh, a minister of a church here in Melbourne before I went to Malaysia at the end of 2009. And I remember uh, some years uh, before that, my assistant minister said to me one day after church, you didn't mention Jesus when you preached. Now, I can't remember what passage I was preaching from, except that it was in the Old Testament. And so that led to an ongoing conversation, uh, really, about the Old Testament and Jesus. Uh, in a way, I don't think he and I differed significantly in our view. I don't think we differed much at all, really, on our view about uh, Jesus through the Old Testament. In the end, I think our difference was about, well, should every sermon mention Jesus? And uh, I realized when I came to Malaysia, I became an itinerant preacher. So I didn't preach in the same church every week. So when I was in my church in Melbourne before going to Malaysia, I, whatever that sermon was, I knew it was part of a series. And the next week I would build on it and the next and the next for a few weeks through a biblical book usually. And so in my mind, I'm building up perhaps to a climax of Jesus. I remember that was part of the conversation with my assistant. But when I became an itinerant preacher in Malaysia, every week I'd be in a different church, and some of you I can recognize names were in churches that I preached in. It was a sort of one-off sermon, and I realized that naturally I became a little bit more explicit about preaching and mentioning Jesus, even preaching through the Old Testament. The, um, but I came across a quote uh, sometime after that. Uh, Spurgeon was a great Baptist preacher, uh, 120 or so or more years ago in London. And uh, he once uh, had a young preacher come to uh, say, what did you think of my sermon? And Spurgeon said, well, uh, you didn't mention Jesus. And it reminded me when I read this quote of Spurgeon that of the conversation I'd had with my assistant some years before. And um, Spurgeon and the, and the person said, well, the passage doesn't talk about Jesus. And Spurgeon's comment was this. Don't you know, young man, that from every town and village and every hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road to London. So from every text of scripture, there is a road to Christ. And your business is, when you are preaching this is, what is the road to Christ? And Spurgeon said, I've never found a text that did not have a road to Christ in it. And if ever I do find one, I'll make sure there is a road. Now, I think he's right. There is always a road to Christ. But what I want us to do tonight is to think, if you like, a bit more nuanced about what is that sort of road or roads and, and how and uh, to what extent do we see Jesus in the uh, Old Testament? Uh, already we've heard uh, briefly mentioned the passage from Luke 24, where Jesus on the road to Emmaus is, uh, say, explains that from the scriptures, uh, how it points to him. And it's not just that it points to him uh, as a person, but uh, rather that, that it, it, it does that in a bit more, a bit more detail, let's say. Uh, the verse uh, 24, Luke 24, 27 says, 
Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. But that's at the end of a conversation where he's spoken about um, what the prophets have declared, the Messiah should suffer and enter his glory, as well as the hope of the nations being the crucified and risen Jesus. So it's not just a sort of vague idea of Jesus, but rather something a bit more specific. Now, it's true that there are many, I think, who do not see and, and, and argue that you cannot see Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, some of you may have heard of Marcion. Uh, Marcion was a, uh, an early church leader, I suppose, a heretic usually is what we think of him now. Um, his adult life was in the second century, so after 100 AD. And uh, he argued that there was no continuity between the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament should be disregarded. Uh, and ind indeed, he tore out bits of the New Testament that he thought were too Jewish or too uh, Old Testament-like. And uh, he's regarded rightly as a heretic. Uh, but, but that tradition lives on. I think in the church in the world, there is a lot of practical Marcionism, that is, where people don't know or understand how the Old Testament leads to Jesus. I've been in churches where people say to me afterwards, that's the first time I've heard a sermon from the Old Testament in years. I mean, literally, I've had that quoted to me several times, including at least in a couple of churches in Malaysia when I used to live there. And, uh, and it may be quite common. And, and that's a practical Marcionism, I think, where people don't really think that as Christians, the Old Testament is valuable enough. They might say, oh, yes, it's part of our Bible and I might read it. But in practice, it's ignored. One of the dangers of ignoring the Old Testament uh, and leading to Jesus was seen, I think, in the trend in the German church in the 18 into 1900s, when theologians said the Old Testament doesn't really lead to Jesus, which led to the anti-Semitism that was seen tragically in Hitler's uh, slaughtering of Jewish people in the 30s and 40s of last century. Uh, it'd be fair to say that... Um, uh, when I was at uh, STM and lived there and taught there in the seven years, um, some of my colleagues, I think, were very reticent to think about the Old Testament leading to the new. One of them, I think, basically would never think that you should lead to Jesus from the Old Testament. Um, and so uh, uh, some would say it's, it's, we should prioritize Jewish views or interpretations of the Old Testament. So periodically in academic places, uh, colleagues, students, other lecturers, whoever might say, but what do the Jewish people think? Because that really, and what they mean by that is because that really is the most important thing, um, their interpretation. Um, I think also uh, perhaps what is also common uh, is, uh, is where people see a connection, but it's mainly a contrast. Um, the language that's used of this, if this is foreign language, don't worry, but dispensationalism sees the Old Testament as, as law and obedience or disobedience and the New Testament, almost new, uh, brand new, being grace and faith. And so dispensationalism sort of structures the view of the Bible as the Old Testament has a, has a very different way of thinking about issues of salvation and how God relates to people. And then Jesus overturns all that almost entirely with a system of grace and faith. Uh, that view, uh, which is very common and, and common in Asia, I've, I, I know of Bible colleges in Asia, which is where, for where that is the basic view, uh, that what that ends up doing is tossing out the Old Testament and, and largely not seeing how the Old Testament leads us to Jesus. But on the other hand, let, that I've given some sort of negative perspectives. There are those who, who, if you like, see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. I can't remember where this was, but, um, but it was in one of my preaching classes somewhere, maybe not in Malaysia, you might be pleased to know, although some of you from other countries, but uh, where, tragically to me, the preacher got up and his text was Psalm 23. 
the Lord is my shepherd. David is speaking about Jesus. And I thought, really? And that made me think that, that there is a simplistic but positive view about how the old and the new relate and how you see Jesus in the old. And that is almost to sort of collapse the Old Testament into in, in whether that's allegorically done or metaphorically done or, or taking away history or anything like that. And you just say, oh, shepherd, Jesus, God, Jesus, as though Jesus is sort of there all the time, right in the forefront. Uh, I think that's, that's a little bit too simplistic uh, in my mind. But we see that happen often where people take those famous passages in Isaiah 7 or 9 and 11, where often they're read at Christmas or in Advent leading to Christmas. Uh, the, 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 the young woman will give birth in Isaiah 7 or the stump of Jesse, the root of David and so on in those prophecies, as though it's all about Jesus, as though what Isaiah is picturing, what Isaiah's hearers would have pictured is almost Jesus, Bethlehem, etc. I think that's a little bit too simplistic uh, in seeing the positive side. So how do we how do we address this? I, I guess one other thing, perhaps, is an introductory comment. So I've just given some negatives. I've given the simple positives. I, I guess the other sort of basic view um, I just want to mention, I suppose, is that um, the the Old Testament needs completion. Uh, it, if you were reading the Old Testament. As a book and you get to the end you say oh but what's next this sort of ends and it, it, without an ending and um and and jewish people today around the world would say it ends with rabbinic judaism uh the mishnah the talmud and other later writings some of which come from the time of jesus or later and they don't see the old testament as complete in itself either nor do we Christians. So the question is, what does it end with? What's the right ending? Is it the Jewish Mishnah Talmud and other rabbinical writings? Or is it indeed the New Testament? And it's certainly the view of the New Testament that it is the completion of the old. Jesus says that in so many different ways, as does Paul or Peter or John. In fact, all the way through uh, the New Testament, every book and letter, basically. My job tonight is not so much to focus on those New Testament comments about the old, but rather to think a little bit more in a way about how to read the old itself. And um, I'm going to sort of uh, mention seven general points. Um, and the first one is we need to see the big picture of the progression or of the Bible's, what some, some call a meta-narrative. There are lots of narratives in the Old Testament. Story of this person doing that thing, whether it's a king, a prophet, or Moses, or Jesus, or whoever. But what is the big overarching narrative of the Bible? Because it is a unifying narrative. That's, that's a pretty critical thing. So if you like, the first sort of strand, I suppose, of seeing how the Old Testament leads us to Jesus is to see the, the, the big picture leading to Jesus. And um, some of you will have heard me do this before when I taught biblical theology or in other classes or seminars. But uh, it, to my view, there are six key blocks of material in the, old, in the Bible, uh, the whole Bible here. And um, the first is uh, creation, the first couple of chapters. Uh, the second is the fall, the next few chapters in Genesis. Uh, but then the longest section is the third one, from Abraham to Malachi. And, uh, and, and those three sections, are, are, for want of a title, to, to put, you know, hang something on it to make it clear, creation, fall, salvation promised, we could say. And, uh, but in, in thinking that of the whole unity of, say, Abraham to Malachi, is that the whole structure, if you like, of their, let's call it religion, faith, relationship with God, their practice, uh, it has no major changes from Abraham to Malachi. That is, it's focused on, uh, as we'll come to in a few minutes, 
the Abrahamic promises being fulfilled with a few additions a bit later on. There's no basic change in, the, in that sort of relationship between Abraham to Malachi. Then fourth section would be, in my opinion, roughly the Gospels, really up to the resurrection. There's some of the Gospels, the very last bit post-resurrection flows into the next section, I think. But in the Gospels, Jesus incarnate on earth, uh, things have changed. We've moved into a, an obviously different era, but it's flowing on from the previous one. So salvation promised Abraham to Malachi, and now we, we get perhaps salvation fulfilled, we could call it. And, uh, and then fifthly, after Jesus has left earth, really, the ascension, I suppose, and if you think of crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost all in the one sort of package, after that event, we have something different again. We have the church, the presence of God through his spirit, our church scattered in the world. And uh, so from resurrection to return, something like that, um, here is salvation lived, but it's also proclaimed. And I use that title because there's a sort of now and a not yet. Now there are people like you and me and the early followers of Jesus who, who have embraced the salvation that Jesus fulfills on the cross. But it's still being proclaimed uh, because there are people who are not yet embracing that. So we're living, you know, in a, in a sort of, you know, in between time. And then the final section, maybe really the end of Revelation, uh, to match the first couple of chapters, you've got new creation. So the new Jerusalem, everything perfect, sinless, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, I, I think that's a helpful thing to get a, a picture of the Bible uh, as a whole. It's easy to remember. If you like symbols, uh, I, can't, I haven't got a blackboard here, obviously, but a big tick for the first one, creation, everything's perfect. A cross, bad, you know, failure. The fall, Genesis 3 to 11, let's say. An, an arrow looking forward, uh, say for Abraham to Malachi, because it's promising something. And then maybe the, 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 cr the, the cross, as in not a cross for bad, but a cross for the crucifixion for Jesus. And then you're looking forward again in lived and proclaimed, and then a big tick at the end. If that's helpful for you, um, uh, you know, run with that. Um, it does seem to me that key to, it, key to those six sections are differences in the way that God is present with his people perfectly present in the first section in, in Eden, in creation uh, section, no sin, God and people in the garden together, expelled from the garden, so a gap uh, between them in the second section. But then God comes closer in the, in the Old Testament section, especially signified in the tabernacle temple behind curtains, rules and regulations to approach God. But still, nonetheless, there's a presence, though also a distance. And then in the incarnation, you could say that God's taken a step closer because he's now present incarnate. And then with post-resurrection at post-Pentecost, you've got God taking a step closer with his spirit indwelling God's people. And then finally, we'll see God face to face again. It, it, that may be helpful for you. Now, now, the point of going through that, and for some of you reminding you probably of that, is that um, we can see that the Bible has coherence. It's moving in a, in a big way. It, in some ways, and I, I don't mean to say uh, liken this to fiction, but um, I, I love reading crime fiction and uh, from all sorts of exotic places, I suppose. And that's my sort of go-to light reading. Um, and in crime fiction, you get a basic structure similar to what I've just outlined, actually. Usually at the beginning, everything's okay for a bit. Then a body's found. Then you get all the clues. And then you get the explanation. And then maybe there's a sort of epilogue of life carrying on. And when I read crime fiction, I never get all the clues. Every clue I look at, I think, oh, yeah, this must be this person. But I realize the clue is always a red herring because it's always much more complicated. But when you read a, a crime fiction novel, as you read forward, you don't know what you don't see the outcome. You, you sort of know there are things pointing there, but you can't always fit it together till the end. But then having got to the end, you can sort of read backwards and say, oh, now I understand that bit or this bit or, or why this person did this, said that or didn't do something. You read it in a new light. And in a way, the Bible's like that, I think. We are to read forwards, but we also read backwards. And it's legitimate to do that um, because the overarching, if you like, meta narrative that binds the scriptures together. So what that means is I'm not thinking here of individual texts so much as 
the big picture of the Old Testament is is moving forwards to Jesus. I realize because I've got a you know artificial background, my hands sort of disappear when I'm waving them around, um, which may look strange, but there we are. So that's my first um, sort of big big thing. And 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 if you're looking through the the story of the Old Testament as it's promising salvation, it may not be clear. You can't say, oh, here is Jesus crucifixion or something. But you know that it, you can see that it's pointing forwards. It's looking forwards to something better than what is already there. Uh, I guess the other thing probably I should have said uh, in this big picture stuff is the key problem in the Bible is human sinfulness. It's right there in Genesis 3. That is the problem that the whole of the rest of the Bible addresses. And it's not that the Old Testament fails to address it. As many think, that's more of a, say, dispensationalist view that gets rid of the Old Testament because it's a failure, plan A that fails. And some say, oh, plan B, totally different plan, grace, Jesus, etc. Forget the Old Testament, it's just a failure. Lots of people think like that. But actually, the Old Testament is, if you like, anticipating the new. It's, it's sowing bits, of, bits and pieces, I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, that leads us to the new. We may not see it totally clearly in each individual text. A second thing, and this now wants, this is like a subset of what I've just said. Uh, as you know, in Peninsular Malaysia, there's the, the North-South Highway um, from, I guess, JB, at least up to Butterworth and beyond. I don't think I've ever been further than that uh, on it. But um, that's the main highway that runs, if you like, through the backbone of, of Peninsular Malaysia. And I guess mostly it's six or eight lanes, or four on each side, three on each side, something like that. So if you can imagine the, the main highway through the Old Testament and through the Bible into the New Testament as well, I think is driven by six lanes, if you want to use a motoring uh, illustration. Uh, the six lanes are like this. Uh, they start off at four, and then, of course, when it gets more, they, you add two more in, like many motorways do. The four that started come with the promises to Abraham. Section three begins. So section one and two are preliminary, sort of everything's good, but here's the problem. And now we've got to address the problem. And when you get to Abraham, you realize that the promises to Abraham are in fact dealing with the problem because of echoes back to the creation and a whole variety of other things. God promises Abraham, in my opinion, four sort of things. They're interrelated. It's a package really, but it's helpful to see them as distinct items. Descendants many descendants, uh, echoed all the way through the Abraham story, but beginning in chapter 12. Land for the descendants to live in. Together, descendants and land is a great nation, but they're separated at different times through the Abraham story and beyond. Blessing, you'll be blessed, your name will be great in Genesis 12 too. And then uh, fourthly, and this is the bit that's often overlooked, I think, by, by church members, scholars, and so on, the promise of the nations being blessed. Those four things are intertwined. It's a, a package deal, so to speak, but they're like the four lanes of the main highway through the Old Testament. Where do they lead to? Firstly, I'd say that anywhere in the Old Testament, one or more of those four things is in the surface of the narrative. So pick David and Goliath, for example, well-known story. Uh, what's it all about? Well, it's a bit obvious what it's about. You know, little boy kills great big giant. Um, but we've got to recognize that what's going on there is a threat to the promises to Abraham, both the killing of descendants by the Philistines and the taking of their land. And, uh, and that you could say that anywhere in, in the Old Testament, in my opinion, uh, pretty much. But when you get to King David, two more are added in. To David were added two promises. One is that there would be a dynasty flowing from him in 2 Samuel 7, 14. Uh, so um, uh, king theme, if you like. And secondly, also promised to David was a temple. Uh, both those two promises under the word house, a house as in a dynasty, a house as in a temple. And um, Solomon builds the temple. Uh, so the temple slash Jerusalem theme uh, becomes significant. So the four-lane highway becomes six. And because, because that's the backbone of the Old Testament, and because it leads to Jesus and the New Testament as part of this big meta-narrative, virtually anywhere in the Old Testament, when you're picking up 
those six or one of those six promises, you will, if you like, hit one of the lanes of the main highway that is taking you ultimately to Jesus. Um, it seems to me that every hope expressed in the prophets, any of the prophets, is expressed in terms of one or more of those themes. The prophets often speak of a Davidic king or descendant from David. That's because of 2 Samuel 7. They often have Zion as the focus of their hope. Say at the end of Isaiah and in Zechariah, that's because of 2 Samuel 7. They talk about the return from exile, from the exile into the promised land. That's because of Genesis 12 promise of land. At the reunification of Judah and Israel in the exilic prophets, that's because of Genesis 12. So all of those promises drive every part, I think, of the Old Testament uh, story. And they lead us to Jesus, not because Jesus so much is descended from David, but because he is the king descended from David and his kingdom of heaven or, or kingdom of God will be forever. He is the living temple. He makes that clear in John 2, etc. And we're built into him as a living temple. And that's in the epistles, Ephesians, 1 Peter, etc. as well. Uh, but also, of course, the other things. Who are the children of Abraham? Now, this, I think, is a really critical question because this really tests what you think about the Old Testament. And I found many in Malaysia would say, oh, they're the Jewish people. They're the children of Abraham, not us. But Jesus says in John 8, I think, um, and Paul echoes this in, in Galatians uh, and Romans, that if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not a child of Abraham. You're actually a child of the devil, Jesus says. I mean, pretty strong words, aren't they? So the descendant promise of Abraham leads us to believe in Jesus. They're the true, we are the true descendants of Abraham. Uh, the land promise, it's so interesting. It's so important in the Old Testament, but in Jesus, it's not important in the same way at all. But he speaks for all the time about the kingdom of heaven. That's, if you like, the land. And again, the epistles like Hebrews 3 and 4 talks about you know, make sure you don't miss out on the eternal rest, not thinking of the land of Joshua so much as the heavenly land. And the new Jerusalem at the end of Revelation picks that up. And blessing, of course, is transformed in Jesus. So in the Old Testament, blessing fits the land that they're going to live in. It's very earthy. But when Jesus speaks words of blessing, Matthew 5, especially the Beatitudes, those blessings are about the end of time, about the kingdom of heaven. You will see God, you will inherit, and so on. And of course, the nation's theme is very clear in the New Testament. You hardly need to comment on that. It's not so obvious in the old, uh, but, but that promise of Abraham finds its fulfillment through Jesus. So the big meta narrative is my first point, but breaking it down into the sort of promise fulfillment, there are, if you like, specific promises of a descendant of David, of a king who'll come, one like David who'll come, the righteous branch who'll come, the nations coming to Jerusalem, and on and on they go. But don't see them in isolation of those major arterial laneways of the motorway, if you like. I, I think that's very helpful to, to see them not too simplistically, I suppose. Um, the, um, so that's, that's, if you like, a... a, a a, a second thing, and um, we could, uh, if we had more time, which we don't, we could, we could think about how Paul sees his mission and uses the Old Testament as the basis for his mission. That's another topic, probably. Thirdly, and again, th these intersect with each other. They're not completely separate. I think it's helpful to understand uh, the relationship of the old to the new in terms of uh, what's often called typology. Now, this is not allegory. I will come back to allegory just to be clear what allegory is different from typology. When, um, uh, when my nephew was about two, uh, he played with little model cars, you know, those little tiny things, and he pushed them around the carpet of his home or out in the dirt in the garden or whatever it was. And as he got a bit older, five, six, seven, the cars became a little bit bigger, a little bit more sophisticated. He had little radio, radio type cars. Well, my nephew is now um, 30, no, 29. What do you think he plays with still little cars? No, of course not. He drives cars. He loves cars, real cars. He's owned more cars than I've ever owned. 
and he drives a police car because he's a policeman now. And uh, so the little model gave way to the big reality. So model to reality or shadow to substance is what typology is about. It's saying, if you like, the Old Testament constructs a model relating God and his people and purposes and salvation and so on, but it's only ever a model and we'll only ever find the reality that the model points towards when we get to Jesus. Another way of uh, putting that together, I remember uh, 20 years ago now, we uh, extended the building where in the church that I was at in Melbourne and we got the architect's drawings and we got them to make a model. So it was a model that was probably as big as a, you know, a, a table in a lecture room, um, or a bit smaller than a one person sort of table. And, uh, but it was useful because we could show people what this was going to look like. And, and they began to get the big idea. But I could have said to them, well, here, here's, here's our new church. We don't need to do anything more. Here it is. But we couldn't fit in it. The model's only, you know, four inches, six inches high or something. The model was for the purpose of the ultimate reality. And that's what the Old Testament is. It's a little bit like a model car that lacks the engine. It has a structure of relating to God uh, through sacrifice, uh, the character of God, um, human kings, uh, and so on. It has laws, but it lacks, it lacks the engine to drive it. And when you get to Jesus, you get the reality, which has the engine of power to drive it. The Old Testament keeps knowing that, that whilst it's set up perfect laws and make perfect promises and puts Israel into a land, they keep rebelling. They keep turning away. The promises keep being delayed or lost for a time because of the people's intransigent sin. And the Old Testament knows that more is needed, an engine, if you like. So at the end, the climax of Deuteronomy um, is God will circumcise your heart so that you will love him and obey him. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Jeremiah puts it like, uh, I will have a new covenant which will be written in your heart, not on tablets of stone. Uh, Ezekiel talks about changing the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. That is something, an engine is needed to change people. And that's where the New Testament comes in. And yes, the New Testament doesn't look exactly the same because the Christians post-resurrection, they don't all go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices and so on. Things have changed. But it's not changed because the old was bad so much as the old was powerless. The old was good, looking forward to something bigger and better. The book of the New Testament that deals with this, I think the clearest, would be the letter to the Hebrews. It's not the only place. It's, you, you, we find this all through the New Testament. But in the letter to the Hebrews, it keeps saying something better. Jesus is a better high priest, a better tabernacle, a better temple, a better covenant. It's not that the old is bad. The old is good, but the new is better. What often I think dispensationalism or other views that put down the Old Testament say is the Old Testament is bad and the New Testament is good. But what I think the Bible does is to say the Old Testament is good. The New Testament is, in fact, better. That's what typology is. So therefore, in the model of the Old Testament, you're going to see something that is like a, a shadow of the reality that comes in Jesus. We're going to see a king appointed by God, but, but not a perfect king. We're going to see a sacrifice, an animal one that's got to be offered time and time again, not the one perfect sacrifice made of Jesus on the cross. Uh, we see approaching to God through a temple tabernacle. We see a better approach in the New Testament. So things that are doing with, if you like, the religious structure of the Old Testament, uh, and even to do with land in a way, you know, the earthly land was a good land, flowing with milk and honey, of course, but we actually have a better kingdom to belong to through Jesus. The earthly land is not, it's not a change of view, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much now. We have a better land, a better kingdom, if you like, through Jesus. So the idea of something good, but something better. That's what typology is about. And um, so the land is, is a, a model uh, 
or typical, if the word type is typology, type is a strange word, we don't use it much, but think of the word typical. You know, the, the temple is typical of, uh, in a way, of, of Jesus, but Jesus is better than the temple of the Old Testament because we, don't, we can go through the curtain uh, through better blood, through a better priest, and so on. Typology is not about allegory, where, where we look at trivial details. So um, I, I remember uh, an example, or well, some of the examples of, of where people allegorize the Old Testament. Um, one of my students preached on this once, um, not uh, in Myanmar at uh, Megst, and um, preached on Elisha, the prophet in 2 Kings 6, I think it is, where he throws a bit of wood in the river so that the axe will float, that the uh, other person has, uh, other prophet has dropped the axe in the water and it's sunk and he's lost it. It's a strange miracle, but so many people think, ah, he th throws in wood, wood. What does wood remind you of? The cross of Christ. Jesus died on the wood of the Calvary's cross. Therefore, this is all about the cross and it's an allegory of the cross. Or Noah's ark is made of wood and therefore it reminds us of the wood of the cross. Well, in the day of Noah, they wouldn't make a boat out of anything else. And Rahab's scarf in Joshua 2 was red, and of course, red is Jesus' blood. They're trivial things, and, and there's no control over that sort of, if you like, link. Uh, I would reject all of those uh, to a degree. Um, I think Noah leads to Jesus in a bigger way because it's an act of salvation and judgment at the same time, but we're picking up the bigger themes rather than the trivial thing of wood. I should say that Marcion, who I said before was a heretic, um, he, what was good about Marcion is he didn't, he saw this is not allegory. It shouldn't be interpreted as allegory. But others like Oregon and Augustine and others in the, who were, if you like, you know, better theologians, they nonetheless thought, well, we know the old and the new need to relate and a way of doing that's allegory. So if you like, the means justifies the ends. We don't mind allegory. I think we've got to be very careful on allegory and typology is not that. Typology, I think, should be governed by what the New Testament shows us of the links um, by and large and keep to the major, if you like, themes of sacrifice, temple, king, land, you know, big, big picture stuff, not just little things like red and wood. There is, though, uh, this is the fourth point. So I've talked about the big meta narrative. I've talked about promise fulfillment. I've talked about typology. There are times, though, when the Old Testament is in parallel with the New. Typology is where the Old Testament shows you a good thing, but the New Testament's bigger and better. Analogy shows something in the Old Testament is, if you like, the same as or in parallel or similar to what's in the New. This mainly occurs in the relational ideas of Israel, God, church, and Christ. So Israel is the wife of God at different times in the Old Testament. Church is the bride of Christ. Very similar idea. It's an analogous idea, really. Um, Israel was commanded to avoid, you know, let's say, idolat uh, idolatry and immorality, and the church should not live like Gentiles in Ephesians. Similar idea, analogous idea. Um, you get similar language, royal priesthood, holy nation in Exodus 19 and 1 Peter 2, for example. So, um, there is a little bit of analogy as well. Uh, there will be things that are similar that are not necessarily just a model looking for something much bigger and better. We should also, though, think of uh, themes that run through, um, and, and, and this overlap, they, all these points sort of overlap to a degree. They're not mutually exclusive. So coming back to Psalm 23, my student once preached, David is speaking about Jesus. I don't think David is directly. I mean, David's not thinking there's going to be a Messiah to come who will be the shepherd, but rather he's speaking about the God whom he already knows, uh, who's not revealed yet as Trinity. The Lord, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, he is, is my shepherd. But shepherd is a theme through the scriptures. So if I'm preaching on Psalm 23, for example, or I'm reading it. It's not a prophecy. It's not a prediction of Jesus. But rather we see that, if you like, the Lord being my shepherd 
is is best of all seen in Jesus, the good shepherd laying, laying down life for sheep. So I'm just trying to nuance this a little bit. Sometimes people think that if we've got to find Jesus everywhere and therefore everything is like a prophecy. And that's a, that's a quick jump. But rather, I think we've got to see the Old Testament is like a, a, you know, a slow flowing river that leads us to Jesus through a number of twists and turns. So the kings of Israel at different times were meant to be shepherds. And Ezekiel, for example, rebukes them in Ezekiel 34, the bad shepherds. They've led the people astray. And he looks forward to a shepherd who will come. Now, I don't think Ezekiel is, is, is envisaging Jesus, but his words are pointing towards Jesus. Who is this shepherd who will come? And, and ultimately, Jesus shows that fulfillment. So I'm just wanting to try and distinguish here that there are texts that are promises of something to come, but, but they're, they're not full in detail. And you can't say that what's envisaged is simply Jesus to come in 400, 600, 800 years. But nonetheless, as we keep reading through the scriptures, we realize that the fulfillment is in Jesus. I think, for example, uh, there's, a, there's the promise of the prophet like Moses uh, made in Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 34 when Moses dies, it says to this day, a prophet like Moses has not come. When Elijah comes as a great prophet in 1 Kings, there's a lot of similarity with Moses. He goes to Horeb. Uh, and there's words and deeds that he does that are very similar. Uh, he, he, well, doesn't die, but he disappears in an unknown place across the Jordan. Moses' burial place is unknown across the Jordan. That's sort of, you'd have to say, Elijah is a prophet like Moses. But that doesn't mean that he's the end of that idea. Maybe the other prophets, Isaiah, Amos, to a degree, they're like Moses. The, the, the miracles and things that they did, Elijah is a bit different and Elisha with him as Moses had, if you like, elements of miracles in the plagues against Pharaoh and the Red Sea and so on. Other prophets less so. But there is a, there is a sort of climax of the theme, if you like, that comes to Jesus. It's not just prophet like Moses, bingo, Jesus. Think in terms of where, where does this lead to? How would the people of the Old Testament understand this? And where does it lead to in the, in the long motorway that runs through the scriptures? So what I call longitudinal themes, um, there are lots of themes that run through. I've talked about shepherd and prophet, but there's themes of um, uh, mercy and judgment and character of God and, and even temple, which we have talked about typologically. Sixthly, that means uh, we come to think about New Testament references. And clearly, of course, when the New Testament quotes something in the Old Testament, uh, we think, oh, well, bingo, here, here is something in the Old Testament about Jesus. But we need to think carefully because the New Testament does that in various ways. They're not, it's not all the same way. It'd be fair to say, I think, that every time the New Testament quotes the Old, it is quoting the context that's in the Old, not just the verse. I... Um, uh, I apologize, I don't know, for example, the Malaysian national anthem, but when I use this illustration in Australia, I would say, Australians all let us rejoice. And everybody knows that's the national anthem. So the, the, the opening line implies the whole, if you know what I mean. If I say the Lord's my shepherd, we think, we don't just think of that idea, we think Psalm 23. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is not just plucking out a few words out of context. He's actually implying the whole psalm, uh, it seems to me. And the New Testament does that time and time again. So what we need to, to think about is, is what, what then is the use? I mean, Psalm 22 is not a prophecy or prediction of Jesus. It's David's lament at the plight that he's in. What Jesus is doing is recognizing that his plight on the cross has parallels to Psalm 22, and that he uses the psalm for expressing his own lament, if you like. So it's not prophecy prediction. Um, the um, another one uh, um, uh, that that is often, I think, misunderstood. Matthew one speaks about 
Jesus Emmanuel, because the young woman will bear a child and God is with us. You know, the passage we read it every year at Christmas. So King Ahaz, worried about the enemy approaching, checking the water levels in the water supply outside Jerusalem, is told by Isaiah that in, in 750 years time, Mary is going to give birth to Jesus, so everything's okay. Doesn't seem to cheer me up if I was King Ahaz. What's being said to Ahaz is that before a woman, young woman, gives birth, people ponder who the young woman is. Is it one of the king's wives his, or, or Isaiah's wife? or who? We, in a way, we don't really need to know who that is. But before this presumably known woman gives birth and the child is weaned, your enemy will be gone. God is with you. Matthew is not saying that Isaiah's words to to King Ahaz are simply a, a bland, simplistic prediction of Jesus coming in 700. That, that's no help to. Like you imagine the Assyrian army is bearing down on you, about to destroy Kuala Lumpur, Penang or Kuching or wherever you might be, and you're told by a prophet, don't worry, in 750 years' time, Jesus is coming. I don't think that's any comfort. The words are appropriate to Ahaz. They're comfort to him. Assyria didn't conquer. God kept his promise. So what's happening then with Matthew is, is not to say fulfilled in the sense of Isaiah 7 is simply a prophecy of Jesus and now it's fulfilled all these hundreds of years later, but rather that what Isaiah 7 was about, that is a young woman giving birth as a sign of hope that you can trust in God and before very long, salvation will come and God's with you. Jesus fulfills, <laughs> fulfills that in an even bigger and better way. That is, there's a sort of pattern going on uh, that, that is fulfilled rather than a simple prophecy fulfillment. So we do have to be a bit careful about how we, how we link New Testament references back into the old. Uh, they, they are showing us that the New T Old Testament leads us to the new and to Jesus, but not in a sort of simplistic way that simply says, oh, David's talking about Jesus in Psalm 23. Ah, oh, Isaiah's speaking about Jesus when he speaks to Ahaz. It's not quite as simplistic as that. Uh, there, is, there is something, that there is more of a, if you like, a pattern being repeated in a way. And the word fulfill in the New Testament, I think, has a much broader meaning than we often use it. Uh, we, we use it more narrowly. The, uh, the other comment I suppose I'd say in passing here would be that the New Testament, when it quotes an Old Testament, is not saying everything about the Old Testament passage. It's not saying that it is only about the cross in Psalm 22. That is, we've got to understand what does it mean then, and then, and then where does the Bible story lead us to, uh, leading to Christ, and how is it used? My last uh, uh, of, of seven sort of points, and then I'll make some summary things at the end, is we do know there are lots of differences between the old and the new. Uh, if there weren't any differences, nobody would be debating in a way the, the relationship of the Testaments and, and, and where the hope of Christ is found in the Old Testament. There are differences. Um, you Malaysians of all people love the fact that you can eat pork, for example, but you couldn't if you lived in the Old Testament. We don't have to go to temple festivals in Jerusalem. I mean, it might be nice to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and Hyen, I think, had a picture of Jerusalem behind her when I first was online with her a few minutes, you know, an hour or so ago. Um, but we don't have to go. We don't have to do pilgrimages uh, as the Old Testament Israelites did. We don't have to live in that land. We live all over the place and, and, and so on. There's, there's lots that's, that's different in a way. We don't live under a human king descended from David, or nor should we. Um, uh, men don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to go and kill the people who live in Jericho, for example. So things have changed. And so wherever you're looking in the Old Testament and something is clearly different from what we Christians can practice or do, the question is, the difference, well, the issue is that the difference is because of Jesus. So again, we're, we're finding Jesus as the sort of linchpin of everything, really. 
both in the, the, the continuity, sorry, where's my arm gone in this thing, the continuity of Jesus, Old Testament to New Testament, that, that's Jesus who the continuity leads to. But when we find something that looks like discontinuity, then what changes that trajectory, if you like, and suddenly it changes, that's Jesus who brings that change. It's Jesus who made all things clean. It's because of Jesus' death, we don't go to Jerusalem, the temple. You know, all those things are changed because of Jesus. Now, that's, that's an indirect finding of Jesus in the Old Testament, if you like. But nonetheless, it brings together both the, the sort of ongoing dilemma of seeing continuity and discontinuity between the testaments but it's actually jesus who is the cause of both he links the continuity but he's in a sense the the reason for discontinuity so i guess what i'm trying to say in a way is that that all the roads the main roads and the little roads that feed into them in the old testament all lead us to jesus not simplistically not not a quick quick jump but rather um, uh, often with twists and turns, but inexorably leading us to Jesus. So it's not that I read a verse and think, oh, Jesus. I think that, that collapses, if you like, the Old Testament history and movement into one thing. Now, I think I've probably, um, have I said enough? I probably have. Let me... Let me conclude with a couple of summary points, just in case you've lost a couple of points. Uh, in my view, uh, Jesus is plan A. Paul says in Ephesians 1 that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. If we take something like that seriously, and that's just one of a few verses I could have used, um, then God knows before the foundation of the world that Jesus will come. That is, even before let there be light, God knows Jesus will come. A lot of us think, ah, why is there a gap of 400 years or so from Malachi to Matthew? Well, God spends time thinking about what he's going to do now because everything he's done so far hasn't worked. Well, that's not how the New Testament understands it. And so Jesus is plan A, and the Old Testament, therefore, is plan A. It's a good model without the engine, let's call it, and the engine comes last, and that's Jesus. There are differences, but that's because a model is always going to be different from the reality, basically. Um, so maybe I'll finish, uh, yeah, I, I, and oh, maybe what I haven't stressed enough is you know, there are, there are clearly prophecies of somebody to come, something to come, a servant, a king, a prophet, less so a priest. We often use the word Messiah and think of a promised one to come. But actually, in the Old Testament, the word Messiah is more often than not used of the king of the day, David in particular, but Saul as well. And, uh, and I think what happens then in the Old Testament as the story keeps going and you don't get to what you're hoping for, then the, the hope of the Old Testament does get pushed out a little bit further and a little bit further, not, not sort of mathematically further so much as it's not imminent. I, I, I think if you read, say, you know, you come to Joshua, you sort of think here we've arrived and all the promises are being fulfilled, but you realize actually as Joshua unfolds, that's not true and it goes down in Judges. And then when you get into Samuel Kings, you think Saul's not good, but oh, David, he's going to, be, he, he'll be it. He's the one. And now we're going to get the full, oh, no, he's not. And Solomon's pretty good, but not that good. And no other king even rates to Solomon until you get to Hezekiah and, and Josiah. And, and then it goes downhill again. So you, the Old Testament story is like waves in a way. It sort of rises and falls and rises and falls, but it never gets to where it's meant to be. And, and as the longer that goes on, the more clearly we see the lack of the engine and therefore the need for Jesus um, at the end, who is the engine. Well, that's probably enough from uh, me, I should think. And um, uh, it's a bit after half past, so we've got about 25 minutes, I, I suppose. Um, and I'll hand over to Debbie, I think, who's 
I haven't seen questions, but Debbie's going to. Sure. Warn me. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Bishop. I think um, you have shared a lot, I've taken a lot of notes. I'm sure that's the same for many people this evening. And the questions are beginning to come in. So I'm going to give some time to all, uh, all of us to uh, check out the Q&A box. Uh, there are already a few questions that have been strongly upvoted. Uh, keep them coming. Um, and I think I will go on while I give you time to just ask a, a simple uh, question uh, to Bishop uh, as you all um, vote as well as uh, put in the final touches to your question. I think the question is, you talked about the promises, the six uh, lanes. Uh, are all these promises fulfilled in Christ fully? Or should we expect um, that, you know, something's going to happen to the land and uh, we see things happening uh, in the past uh, couple of decades, few decades, and many people have been very involved in uh, world affairs. Uh, so what do you think? Are all promises that you mentioned, the six lane, are all of them fulfilled in Christ? Uh, yep, they're all they're all fulfilled in Christ, um, and they'll be, if you like, fully fulfilled in the return of Christ. It's only when He returns that we we, we you know the New Jerusalem is brought down from heaven. Um, you referred to the land in particular, and Jesus makes it clear that the earthly land is of no theological consequence anymore, out of the model. Mm. And Jesus speaks always about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, depending on uh, the title that's used in whichever gospel you read. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's the land that matters. And that tr transition changes really with the resurrection, uh, where Jesus says, go to the ends of the earth. But he doesn't say, bring people back to the land. Paul never says, come to the land, make pilgrimages. Never, never. It's astonishing to me to change. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're now dealing with the kingdom of heaven. And the earthly mm -hmm. land of what's now called Israel and Palestine is of no theological significance anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with that, I will um, move to uh, Dr. Tom Mui's question, which is kind of linked. So why do some people, there's a division of the Old and New Testament. Uh, in turn, why do some people see Jesus in the Old Testament and not others? And that continues to be a divide in the church today. You mentioned, Bishop, about dispensationalism and um, the, the, the two quite different ways of viewing uh, the fulfillment of these promises. So Dr. Tom Nguyen and 14 others ask, why do these uh, this difference uh, persist or exist? Well, there are differences that exist in, in virtually everything, theological and non-theological today. Um, so difference should not surprise us, I suppose. Um, it could be differences exist because we're being taught badly, for example, um, uh, or, or um, a whole range of things. We, I've tried to point out that there is continuity and discontinuity uh, between the Testaments. Uh, in the New Testament, you can find verses where Jesus and or Paul say, I've come to uphold the law, and others where you know we've got a new law, a new covenant, Etc. That is, you can find little verses that, or bits of verses that say nothing's changed, or you can find bits that say it's all changed. And um, and so we have to be we have to be careful, I think, um, uh, in that. And because because of that sort of continuity discontinuity, I guess it's partly how do people weight that. Um, but it seems to me that Jesus' words and Paul's words overall are very clearly in in the line of continuity. That the old leads to the new, uh, right from you know the road to Emmaus, but but in all over the place as well. I mean, Jesus to the Pharisees, time and time again. So uh, that seems to be the right way to read it, I think. And as I said earlier on, I think it's legitimate to read both forwards, that is, from old to new, but also backwards again. Uh, that's not an illegitimate thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, next is uh, by. Uh, Brother Christopher Rao, uh, he asks, are there, what is the criterion to identify uh, the typology uh, of Christ? How do we know what these types are? What would be some of them? Yeah, my, my view is a bit cautious on this, um, and there is some debate amongst theologians. Uh, my view would be that we are legitimate. It, it's legitimate, of course, where the New Testament 
users typology, uh, we can do the same. So on the themes of covenant, priest, sacrifice, temple, land, you know, Melchizedek to Jesus, Moses to Jesus, Joshua to Jesus, David to Jesus, those links you can all find at different points in the New Testament at a typological level. So I, I think they're, they're all legitimate. Flood and baptism, for example, in 1 Peter 3. Um, the uh, return... Uh, um, uh, so, um, so I think my, my view would be that um, the New Testament gives those to us. There are some who would say, well, the New Testament gives us some, but there would be others as well. Is Joseph, for example, in Genesis, is that Joseph a type of Christ, a model of Christ? And um, I would say, well, the New Testament doesn't give us that example, so we need to be cautious. And I think we need to think, are these big things and big issues with Joseph rather than trivial things? And, um, and so... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as convinced about Joseph, but some are. Um, but, but basically keep, in typology, keep to the big, the big things, people, places, institutions, basically. Uh, that is, you know, temple, Israel church, uh, priesthood, uh, kings, kingship. Keep to the bigger things if you're unsure. So many of us, uh, we find this uh, very helpful and I think many of us want to know more. So there are quite a number of participants who are asking for books, resources, uh, reference books that could be used uh, when preparing to preach from an OT passage or just to um, help us to think through this topic. Um, recommending books is always tricky because everybody reads at a different level. Um, at a simple level, um, some of you might be helped by, say, Vaughan Roberts, uh, God's Big Picture, I think it's called. Um, he, he puts things in, I think, straightforward language that's useful. He doesn't cover everything of what I've talked about, um, but it'll help you get the big picture, the big promises, the links between the testaments at a much more sophisticated level. Uh, and this really, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a, a harder book to read, and probably, you know, somebody who's not done theological study might find it tricky. It would be um, Sidney Gray Darnas's book, *The Ancient Text and the Modern Preacher*. He's thinking a bit of preaching then, um, in particular, but um, but I think his he draws together the key points pretty well. Graham Goldsworthy, an Australian now quite an elderly person, has written a few books about. Um, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I don't have my file open quickly here. Let me um, speak while I try and find it. Um, the, um, he has a couple of books that do it. I, I find Goldsworthy is not quite straightforward reading sometimes. Um, so some may, may find him a little bit harder to, uh, to read. Um, here we are. Let's see what else I've written down here. Um, that, 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 yeah, that might, there, there are some good introductions to Old Testament, I think, um, that will lead people in the right direction. Um, uh, yeah, Goldsworthy's Gospel and Kingdom. I think Vaughan Roberts does the same thing in an easier way. Um, and um, uh, Ed Goldsworthy more fully does it in um, what is it the whole Bible finding the whole Christ in the whole Bible something like that. Um, I've opened that's the wrong file anyway. Um, that that's probably um, uh, oh, here we go. This is a better. Um, I, I think. Um, People like Chris Wright are good and clear and readable. Um, so um, he's got a book on preaching the Old Testament, but he's got a book on Christ in the Old Testament and indeed God and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, so Chris Wright's, I, I think, very good um, on this sort of topic. Um, yeah, that 
I mean, there, there are lots of other things around. I don't want to inundate you with books. Edmund Clowney, Preaching Christ in All of Scripture, that's, that's not a bad book either. Uh, Goldsworthy's book, a bigger book, is Preaching the Whole Bible as Christian Scripture. Um, yeah, that'll do. Thank you so much, Bishop. I'm just going to combine uh, two, two questions over here. Uh, Daniel asks, is preaching Jesus in and through the, the Old Testament the same as preaching the gospel through the Old Testament? And Reverend Vijay Yedas Das asks, um, should I include my sermon by pointing to Jesus if I choose an OT text? So um, yeah, is preaching Christ in you know the same as preaching the gospel through the OT? And should we do it? Um, the gospel's about Jesus. So, um, you know, the, the, so, so finding the gospel in the Old Testament is finding Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, the words are not synonymous exactly, but, but you can't have one without the other. Um, the, um, I think my own view of preaching the Old Testament would be, uh, it depends where you are, whether you're going to refer to Jesus every time in a sermon. I think that was the second part of the question. Um, so if I'm preaching a series in a, the same church, for example, through the Old Testament, I may choose to sort of build up to a climax. So I recall some years ago preaching a series through the early chapters of 1 Samuel. Uh, the leadership of Eli was bad. They were looking for a king. They were wanting a king. They end up with Saul. And I, I, rem I can't remember the exact words I sort of used, but I sort of had, but isn't there a better king? Isn't there a better leader? And then in the final se of the series, I don't think I went through the whole of 1 Samuel, but I forget now, was I, I more explicitly took us then to where does this lead to in Jesus? But I was trying to hint at that in the earlier sections. But if I'm preaching one sermon in one place, um, you know, as a visitor, I think I, I have found that I'm, I should be more explicit uh, leading to Jesus. But I don't want to do that in every in simple ways. You know, I've heard so many sermons that sort of expound an Old Testament passage and then say, so what does this all mean for us? Well, in the end, we need Jesus who dies for us and we're forgiven and therefore we should trust in him. And it's almost like a little, you know, uh, formula to, to add on the end. What I've, what I've tried to sort of show in the different sorts of things here is that text will lead us to Jesus down slightly different routes or different lanes of the highway through different twists and turns over time, not quickly jumping necessarily. And we should let the text direct us like a GPS to Jesus, if I can put it like that. Thank you, Bishop. The next question is quite a practical- oh, let, let, me, let me, sorry, let me just give sure. one other example. Yes. I remember, I, I can't remember the text that I preached on, but it was, um, it was something like a warfare text in the Old Testament, something like that. Something that's, that we wouldn't do in practice today. And I have a feeling I might have begun this on, we know Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And I just sort of commented on that. So what on earth are we doing with a text that says, go and kill all the people of you know, Jericho or AI, whatever, whatever it was. So what I was trying to do there was show right from the start, the difference between now and then. In fact, I think I've also begun a sermon once. We all eat pork. So what are we doing with this text that says you can't? So, you know, that's another way of leading us to Jesus, if that makes sense. Okay, um, this question here, I think it's quite a practical question because we see uh, many, you know, sermons, perhaps from certain churches or even articles uh, that talk about Jesus appearing in, possibly appearing in person physically in the Old Testament, particularly when it's a physical form, uh, maybe you know some people say that the Trinity, you know, vi uh, visited uh, Abraham, and maybe the angel of the Lord was Jesus in person, and so on. What is your view on that? Has Jesus ever appeared in person, physically, in the Old Testament, meeting, interacting with God's people? Um, I would say no, in the sense of physical being incarnate, um, because the incarnation begins at Bethlehem. Um, but God in the Old Testament is the Trinitarian God. So when God appears or God speaks, 
then you know it could be father son and or spirit all three or one of the three appearing so it's not impossible um and and there is some you know slightly obscure language or not obscure um you know the language is not fully clear in identifying the visitors to abraham for example um some would say yes there's jesus here uh, others not so i i don't think um I, I think it's worth thinking what, what's to be gained in our understanding if we argue and are convinced that this is Jesus rather than, you know, God, but we're not sure who of God or an angel. That is in the Abraham bit. I, I don't know. It's certainly God is there. Whether that's Father, Son or Spirit, does that matter? Um, so I, I don't discount the possibilities of Jesus at work in the Old Testament, of course, because it's God. I mean, when when the creation is made, that's God, Jesus. Uh, we, we know that from, you know, Colossians 1, for example, 15 onwards. So, um, so when we see, and one of our dangers is that when we see Yahweh, God in the Old Testament, we think God the Father. But actually, it's interesting how many uh, references in the Old Testament that are Yahweh said or you know, Yahweh did, and that's applied by Jesus or to Jesus by others in the New Testament. So we shouldn't discount or separate Yahweh God from Jesus. But I'm I'm not sure that there's you know much that's absolutely clear about uh, Jesus appearing um, in the Old Testament. Could be, but I'm not sure that we gain much. Okay, thank you so much. And the final question, uh, Bishop, before maybe we ask for some final um, blessing or remarks uh, or advice for the Malaysian church and the different people here. You mentioned uh, a bit about the discontinuity, right? And just, uh, I think David asked, is there a passage in the OT that is not fulfilled by Christ? Maybe we can talk about or hear a bit more from you about some examples of these discontinuities you mentioned earlier about the killing and so on and so forth. Um, can you can you share some advice for us in that area of discontinuities? Yeah, a discontinuity I think is not particularly about a promise that's not fulfilled. The discontinuity shows that the structure of how you see the the model, if you like. Is different from the reality. It's looking to the reality. The reality is better, but it's different. So to pick my nephew's example of little cars when he was two, those cars needed to be pushed. The car he drives now doesn't need to be pushed. It's got an engine. That's a discontinuity, but there's obviously a continuity at the same time. There's discontinuity with some laws, of course. We've talked about pork and so on, but um, but the discontinuities within those things are because of the bigger changes to the better reality. Uh, what I mean by that is this, uh, the killing of the, the Canaanites, let's say, which is a big ethical issue um, these days, uh, we, we are not going to kill, you know, Canaanites. I mean, they don't really exist particularly, but we're not going to kill anyone in the name of Christ. We shouldn't be. Why? Not because Jesus says, be a peacemaker and love your enemy, but because we are not fighting for that particular or any particular earthly land. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. There is armor language in Ephesians 6 and military language here and there in the New Testament, but it's not about physical killing of people. It's about language that protects us and, and fights for the kingdom, if you like, at a spiritual level. And that's, that's nothing less than, that's actually greater than uh, the land of the Old Testament. So uh, in the Old Testament, uh, so there's a lot in the Old Testament about protecting land and protecting it from enemies and guarding it and, and so on. Um, so, so the discontinuity is reflecting the movement from a model to the reality. And we'd say the same with the, the food laws. So why can we eat pork? Uh, my view of the, the food that are unclean in the Old Testament is simply, they're almost arbitrary. I mean, there's various rules, you know, thoughts about this and some think hygiene, which is a bit strange when Jesus declares them clean. He doesn't change their, you know, their healthiness. 
but um, but it's linked to, uh, of course, Cornelius and the vision and the Gentiles, go, the gospel going to the Gentiles in Acts 10. So in the Old Testament, if you like, th there's a subsection of food that's clean and and more foods that are unclean, which which parallels Israel being, if you like, clean in a in a world of Gentiles that are unclean. And and the contrast, the the connection between the two is clearest in Deuteronomy 14. But now that the gospel goes to the ends of the world more explicitly after the resurrection, um, that, that sort of distinction, if you like, changes. Now, we are meant to be morally different and better than the Gentiles, but the food laws are not sort of part of that anymore. So it's part of the promise to the nations, to bless the nations, that sees that sort of shift and development even how the nations are going to be one shifts because in the old testament largely it's a centripetal motion into the center the attraction of israel as a holy people deuteronomy 4 for example and um you see that a little bit say in in um in uh, naaman the syrian coming in um and and the queen of sheba coming in to solomon but you never really see israel go out to win the nations uh, they get it wrong, of course. Israel gets things wrong. But it's more of an attractional model. In the New Testament, the attraction model is still there. It, it, as church, we are to be attractive to the world. But the going out is much more explicit. So there's a shift there. And Jesus is the cause of that discontinuity. But it's the same promise. Mm. So it really pivots on the fulfillment of the promise and um, that change of things that uh, makes things different from us. Thank you for explaining regarding the killing, how it's because of the promise in terms of the land, you know, that it's we are no longer fighting for a piece of land, but that yeah. the whole world uh, is to be one for Christ. Yeah. There's, there's other things too, like the blessings of the Old Testament are all land-centered, blessings of crops, animals, rain, children, uh, protection from enemies mm. and sickness and all so on. When you get to the New Testament, mm. blessings in the Beatitudes, the blessings in the, the epistles, <laughs> The kingdoms to blessing they're much different um so so those things shift as well uh, actually and it's interesting in the in paul when he speaks in 1 corinthians 7 about being single as i am um that's the first time really that anybody in scripture says that being single is a good thing in the old testament it was assumed that you'd be married to have children to bring them up in the faith because that's how you're you're growing the church or the people mm -hmm. of god if you like mm -hmm. but but in the New Testament, it's about spiritual children, actually. It's about those mm. who believe that matter. Mm. So again, there's a continuity there with, with a discontinuity at the same time. Mm. Thank you so much, Bishop, for explaining that. Do you have any last words for us before we close? Well, um, uh, keep, keep reading the Old Testament, keep teaching and believing the Old Testament, and keep preaching it for those who are preachers. And, um, and keep seeing it in unity with the new, despite its shifts and changes and discontinuities from time to time. Mm. Okay, and I and hope one day before long, I'll be there in person in Malaysia again and uh, yes. catch up with many of you. Indeed, yes. Could you pray for us, uh, Bishop? And we'll sure. try to close. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you everyone for being part of this. It's, um, I'm sorry, there's no time obviously to chat with you and uh, go and have um, you know something to eat in the in the hawker stalls, but uh, nonetheless, uh, hopefully one day soon. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we do indeed thank you that all scriptures testify to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And we thank you that uh, all scripture is uh, breathed out by you, inspired and, and for our benefit to make us wise for salvation in Jesus. And so as we read uh, the Old Testament, we do pray that we will keep seeing Jesus, keep uh, being drawn to him, attracted to him, trusting him, believing him, following him and obeying him and living for his glory. And we ask this for the church in Malaysia, uh, but also for those who have joined here from Singapore or Guatemala or Cambodia, Myanmar, Australia and other places, and pray that uh, we may live for the glory of Jesus in all that we do. And we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop Paul. It's uh, really nice to have you with us this evening. Thank you for spending your time with us. And to the rest of the participants, thank you for being here, for all your questions. Really, really good discussion that we've had here. Uh, very applicable and practical for us uh, as we continue to serve the Lord. Uh, so goodbye. Uh, and um, there was a question about the 
uh, contribution where that can be directed to and I will share that with you right now for you to perhaps take a screenshot uh, or to scan it directly. Um, thank you. See you. Bye-bye.